Um, my name is Erin Fernandez Balmer, uh, one of the organizers of the Global Talk series for this year. This is Global Talk um, number eight. Um, a lot of the faculty that are in this room have already done uh, Global Talks. Um, but today, we welcome Dr. Uh, Maricela Flaitis Lear. Uh, she teaches Spanish and literature at Green River College, and she's co founder and co chair of the Instructional Diversity Committee at Green River College. She has a PhD in Romance uh, Languages and Literatures from the University of Washington and an ABD in philosophy from the University of Havana, Havana Cuba. <laughs> She's Cuban American, born and raised in Cuba, living in the USA since 1992. Her research and publications examine the construction of images of women in Latin America and Latino literature from the perspectives of literary, gender, and cultural studies. Um, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Martin <laughs> Let's see, is this, yeah, this is working. Yeah, can you hear me well? Okay. So I started with this video, I don't know if you were, uh, well, those of you who were here earlier, um, which is a video created by a collective of uh, mostly women dancers in Argentina. Um, it's, uh, they're dancing by the beach uh, on this particular piece of the coast of Argentina where many of the bodies of the disappeared during the dictatorship in Argentina that were thrown from airplanes uh, were found. And so um, this particular dance was created to commemorate, uh, to memorialize uh, those who were um, killed, tortured, disappeared uh, by not only the Argentinian dictatorship, but by all the dictatorships in the world, particularly in Latin America. So um, I'm going to talk today, um, I'm going to try to concentrate on, uh, as much as I can, right, on a very broad topic. I actually teach a whole quarter, a class on this topic with this very same name. So hopefully for the students who are here might be motivated to taking that class. Um, I'm teaching that again probably in the winter of next year, Humanities 200. So the topic is a huge topic, right? Women in Latin America struggles and literature. And of course, I, as a literature person, I had to bring you books. So I have a display there of some of the books that, my, uh, that deal with this topic. Some of them are collections of poems uh, by Latin American women writers. I want you to focus, uh, to pay attention for a second to what this woman has written on her face. Uh, we are right now in the United States in the midst of the Me Too movement, right? Um, and this will be kind of the equivalent to the Me Too movement in Latin America, uh, but it, it, it was born out of a different, completely different conditions, completely different situations, and that's uh, what I would like to convey today in my message, right? Um, the commonality and also the many, many differences that are um, uh, the roots of the feminist and women's movements in Latin America. And I will also talk about that, uh, those two concepts I said, which are not the same. Um, if you look at what she has written on her face, it says, ni una menos, um, which will be translated as not one woman less, right? And we'll see why later in my talk, uh, why this is the case. Right? The Me Too movement is I am also, right, in, in, indicates I'm also someone who, in the United States, right, and in many parts of the, of the world, someone who has received abuse, harassment, discrimination. In this case, the movement is not one woman less, right? So that's an interesting distinction um, that I would like to make. Okay, well, this is not what I expected. How do I go? Ah, there you go. So I would like to start with some foundational, um, a foundational story. So here you have a, an excerpt from a letter of a friend, a childhood friend of Cristobal, uh, Christopher Columbus that came with Columbus in the second voyage to the Americas, to the Caribbean, right? And um, in this letter, which he wrote uh, in 1495, right, uh, when he came back, went back to, um, to Spain, uh, he wrote of you know, all the adventures they had in the trip. And um, 
when people ask me, why are you again celebrating Columbus? Um, I only have to read this excerpt. And it says, so this is an excerpt of the letter. And um, uh, Michelle de Cuneo, which is the childhood friend, Columbus childhood friend, uh, says, while I was in the boat, I captured a very beautiful Carib woman, an indigenous woman from the, from the Caribbean, right? Um, whom the said Lord Admiral, that's Columbus, right? Which is the Lord Admiral of the ship, right? Uh, gave to me. So Columbus gave to Cuneo this woman. And with whom, having taken her into my cabin, she being naked, according to their custom, I conceived the desire to take pleasure, right? I wanted to put my desire into execution, but she did not want it, and treated me with her fingernails in such a manner that I wish I had never began, the Cuneo wrote. But seeing that, to tell you the end of it all, I took a rope and trashed her well, for which she raised such unheard of screams uh, that you would not have believed your ears. Finally, we came to an agreement in such a matter that I can tell you that she seemed to have been brought up in a school of harlots, right? So obviously at some point the woman said, okay, what can I do here? Uh, let him have it, right? Um, this is a, um, an image from one of the National Palace mural paint, paints, uh, paintings by Diego Rivera in Mexico, uh, Socal. So what are the concepts, and I don't have time to go through these concepts, but we can talk about them later, right? What are the concepts that normally we use when we talk about Latin American women today um, in the academia? Um, so this is the kind of the key theoretical framework that we can use, right? Um, one is the, the, the system, right, of concept of sex, gender, sexuality system, uh, mostly addressing the issue of the fact that gender is a social construct, right? So gender is a concept, it's an idea, it's, a, it's something, that, something that is socially constructed, right? So the fact that we, we're expected to act a certain way is a social historical construction, right? Um, of course, the concept of patriarchy and paternalism, um, the concept of Marianismo, which is a very common concept when we talk about Latin America, um, and is the idea that uh, women are, it's, it's an ideal placed on women, that they are supposed to perform and, and act like the Virgin Mary, right? And that has been uh, deemed Marianismo, right? Um, the concept of machismo, of course, which most of you might know, right? That the, this ideal stereotype that is constructed for how males should ask, act, act, right? And that is, of course, connected to uh, patriarchy and paternalism. Uh, the idea of malinchismo, which is also very specific to the Latin American context, the word malinchismo comes from the word malinche, uh, which supposedly was the mistress of Hernán Cortés and was very instrumental in the conquest of Mexico and is a very interesting figure that feminists nowadays have appropriated, uh, rightly so and reinterpret it um, because she has been conceived usually as the traitor of the Mexican race. Uh, and uh, feminism today has a different interpretation of this historical figure. Um, one important element that, is, uh, uh, that we need to keep into consideration is the importance of anti-essentialist uh, anti analysis, right? Um, and in uh, simple terms, we're talking here about the fact that we tend to think about the Latin American woman, right? The concept of what is a woman, a man, a this, right? And we, ad we attribute, we, we, we think about some essential elements of those concepts, right? And I will um, argue against that, right? Since every concept against the construction um, but also it's a historical construction, right? So what is understood to be one thing, right? What was understood to be one thing in the 17th century is completely different than today. So the historicism 
right, the historical nature of all social constructs, of all social concepts is extremely important. And this idea that there is no essential truth, right, that is the, you know, that is a, a, an unchangeable um, essence that everybody has to fit into that, right? So more or less, that's what we're talking about. Uh, and of course, an, a very important concept and very much present also in the latest waves of feminist thinking in Latin America is the concept of intersectionality. Uh, the idea that we should analyze women's situations, not just um, taking into consideration either their biological sex or their attributed gender, but all the elements, right, that, that conform that identity, including ethnicity, race, um, uh, ability, age, right? So all the elements that, that connect um, and, and form, right, and, and determine in each historical period how things are portrayed or how um, and, and how different groups are conceived and function in society right so these are kind of uh, general uh, key concepts that we normally use and of course there are many more but um, I also wanted to talk about some common stereotypes uh, that have been developed historically in the popular consciousness, um, very present in Hollywood movies, in all in Latin American folklore, right? Some historical stereotypes about the Latin American woman that I already told you doesn't exist, right? But in the stereotypes, there, there is this idea that there is the Latin American woman, right? And that Latin American woman is either this super madre, right? The, the sacrifi sac sacrificed mother, which is morally superior, devoted, subservient. And I love this image to the left because it's a very, very little known image. That is Fidel Castro's mother. Uh, kind of the day after he entered Havana in 1959, uh, she is praying there to the Virgin Mary, right? And she was an absolutely self-effacing woman. Um, so, yeah, I took that from a 1959 magazine in Cuba, and no one knows that image. Um, the woman in the right is a woman who um, is very revered in Cuba. She is the mother of, uh, of five or six uh, independence warriors. Um, the most notable of, of them was Antonio Maceo, which is like one of the most important independence fighters against Spain. Uh, and he was a mulatto man, he was of mixed race. Um, and uh, it's interesting to me, I have an article written about her because uh, it's interesting to me that she is revered because she's the mother of Antonio Maceo, rather than because she was actually a fighter in the independence wars against Spain. Uh, that yes, you know, pushed her sons to fight for independence, but she herself was with the troops fighting, right? So again, it's this idea that she, you know, these women are revered as the model of women because they are subservient to, right? a male-dominated cause, ideas, et cetera, right? Another common stereotype, uh, much current, right, um, is uh, that women are these very devoted, not demanding uh, workers uh, that maintain their femininity in the workplace. And I, I have really interesting images about these, but we don't have time to go through it. But this is an important element for something I'm going to tell you later. Um, Another common stereotype, and believe it or not, this is an image taken from one of the Cuban most famous cabarets where all the tourists go. Uh, so these are real bots. <laughs> is, uh, is the image of uh, this Malinche Eve, right? The, the, uh, the, the Latin woman, essentially sexual, sensual, right? Which is very valued by her sensuality and sexuality, right? Um, and if we think about Eve in the Christian 
of course, foundational mythologies, right? We think about Eve as the one that causes the fall, causes to eat the fruit, whatever you mean by that, right? Um, so in any way, they're the causes of men's falling, right? So um, these are some of the names. Uh, when we think about the women's movement and the feminist movement in Latin America, um, I wanted to highlight the fact that um, when we think about feminism and women's movement, most of the time we're thinking about the first world, quote unquote, right? The ideologies, the theories that came from France and Germany and of course the, the, uh, the United States, right? Um, but the reality is that uh, the quote unquote third world, right? The non, the less developed, uh, uh, countries have produced tremendous amount of theory, uh, tremendous amount of analysis, social analysis, and have a long history of women's activism in their history. And so, so these are some of the key women in Latin American history uh, to which we owe right, the successes um, of today's Latin American um, women's movements and women's thought. Right? Um, the first image there is of Juana Inés de la Cruz. Uh, she was a Mexican poet um, and nun who entered the convent because she wanted to go to the university and she couldn't, so her only option to avoid marriage uh, was to become a nun. And uh, she is considered the 10th uh, muse uh, of uh, the 17th century in Europe. It's an extremely, extremely important woman uh, who ultimately was condemned to silence uh, by the Inquisition because her poems were deemed irreverent, um, maybe with homosexual tendencies, right? Um, and, uh, and disrespectful to the church. Um, there's a great movie that everybody should watch. It's called I, the Worst of All. You need to watch that movie. Uh, one of the, I, I always like to say, history has a way of, of you know, bringing revenge uh, because today, nowadays, her former convent in Mexico City is a university. And guess what's the name of that university? Sor Juana Inés University. Right? And you can actually visit her cell uh, where she lived as a nun. Right? So it's a, it's a fascinating revenge against those who condemned her for her writing, her writings, her poetry, and her amazing. She had at some point the largest library in the Americas in her cell. She was just devoted to you know, reading, writing, understanding. Um, and then there are several, um, I teach my students a lot about Angela Batallas, which is again a very um, not well-known person, um, because uh, we, uh, Angela Batallas actually, during the independence wars against Spain, she's, she's that African-American, uh, Afro, um, um, Afro, Afro-Ecuadorian woman here, image, right? her image there. Um, she, uh, during the independence wars, against Spain in the 19th century, uh, she confronted the most important leader of the independence wars in South America was Simón Bolívar. And this woman had the guts, she was a slave, right? She was born a slave. And she had the guts to go to Simón Bolívar and say, how can you talk about freedom if you don't talk about the freedom of the slaves, right? And so she presented a case it's a long story that I won't tell you, but she presented a legal case, and we have actually the legal documents, and it's, obviously, it's obvious that those legal documents were actually dictated by her um, to a lawyer, and she actually eventually uh, won her freedom. Uh, she won the case, which is another great thing. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting figure, right? Um, 
and so on. And so on. Camila Enrique Sureñas from the Dominican Republic actually established, and she has uh, a, a lot of important writing. She eventually came to Cuba and taught at the university, and she uh, led uh, feminist circles uh, in Cuba um, in the 1940s, uh, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. Um, and she um, was one of the organizers of feminists with that name. Um, uh, gatherings in Latin America to talk about women issues and particularly to fight for uh, w the, win the right to vote um, for women um, in all of Latin America. So what I was trying to prove is that the, what we have today has the precedent. There is a long history, right? Um, whoops, what did I do? Oh. So when we talk about women movements and organizations in Latin America, we have to um, keep in mind that there are two, say, two branches, two different things within this. What we call the Movimiento de Mujeres, women's movement. Um, and I know I shouldn't be doing this, this amount of words in this, this slide, but I'm doing it no matter what. Um, and the feminist movement. Right? So those are two different things, more and more interrelated, but not in its origin. So when we talk about women's movements, we're talking about uh, women who gathered and, and have organizers at di different moments in different countries to face crises, different crises in, di in those countries, uh, but not necessarily um, and they fight, they, for instance, these are the women who go out in the streets and banging pots and pans, uh, women who protest uh, dictatorships for uh, disappearing their sons and their, uh, and, and their, chi their children and their husbands, etc. right? Uh, but they're not, uh, their activism is not necessarily linked to gender-specific demands. Right? In fact, um, some uh, uh, Marisa Navarro, a very a great scholar, uh, coined this term of the tricks of the weak, quote unquote. Right? So these women are using their positionality as women, as these sacred mothers, remember? Right? As, as, as these super madres, right? who are so morally superior and respected, and they're women of the church to go out in the streets and confront the dictators and say, where are my kids, right? Uh, to confront the local leader and say, uh, where's the money that you're, you know, um, taking from us, right? Uh, to confront the, the owners of the mine, right, in Bolivia and say, the working conditions for my husband who is a miner in this, uh, in this mine is, is is, is wrong, right? You need to, to work on this, and they bang on these, you know, uh, owners, you know, big owners, big corporations that own these these mines, right? To improve the con the labor conditions, but they don't. They're not doing that as women or to defend women's issues, right? But they're rather doing it as mothers' concern for their kids, and they have been extremely effective. Right? Because it's hard for, for instance, Pinochet or Videla and all these dictators who um, came to power in the name of you know, defending the true religion and, um, and as, as this very you know, strong macho who defend the sanctity of these women to say to these women, hey, right? So, uh, for instance, um, I'm sure mo many of you have heard of the women of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, who to this day, I saw them in, our, in I marched with them in December, it was one of the highlights of my life. Um, they're still marching every Thursday, asking, where are my kids, right? And they march with these, you know, white um, scarves on their heads, uh, head scarves, thank you, um, as women, right? as mothers, as grandmothers, right? The other group, uh, the other branch, let's say, of the women's movement is the actual feminist movement um, with organizations that fight for gender-specific demands, right? Gender-specific agenda. 
um, and here you have uh, different methods from legal fights. Uh, for instance, right now Argentina is in a very strong legal fight to legalize abortion, which is not legal in Argentina. Um, to magazine collectives, to discussions, to women's houses to protect uh, you know, women against the domestic abuses. But again, uh, these are very gender specific uh, agendas, right? Um, I have a long historic overview of women's movements, um, and I'm sorry, of the feminist movement in Latin America. I'm not going to, I'm just going to overwhelm you with what you're seeing so that you see that actually there is a very long history, particularly since the 1960s. Um, what I want to point out here, I have like three slides of these different organizations by years, right? But what I, what I want to point out is that in the 1960s, of, of course, in the United States and in Europe in general, right, there was a very strong development of feminist organizations, like we have the organization, the National Organization of Women, right, in, in the United States now. Um, and Latin American women, Latin American feminists were extremely suspicious of the so-called first world feminism, right? Um, and they, um, and this was absolutely evident in 1975. Uh, the United Nations organized in Mexico City uh, their conference on um, women issues in the world, right? Uh, and declared the decade of, uh, for women, for, for the advancement of women in the world. And in that huge gathering of all the countries in Mexico City, um, many indigenous women, many Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latina women, many uh, Afro-Latin American women, uh, women from all over Latin America, um, really expressed their um, discomfort with the feminism that was coming from the North, right, in 1975, uh, because at that moment, these women from Latin America were actually expressing what today we understand as, of course, right? So these women were saying, where is the intersectionality in your analysis? Where is me as an indigenous woman? My issues are not your issues, right? Where is the space? What space are you, how are you trying to understand me? Which of course is what Bell Hook later said, right? And um, so, uh, but these women, Latin American women, were much ahead of their time, right, in understanding that, um, again, you cannot talk about women issues as the one thing, right? That you have to understand the historical context, the intersection of so many elements uh, that go into this, the historical nature of those battles, right? Um, and the fact that you cannot impose your concepts just because they're coming from the North, right? Or from the quote unquote developed centers of thoughts and philosophies. Um, so, um, from the 1980s to the present, there have been, like in the United States, there have been several different waves of feminisms in uh, Latin America. Um, uh, and in those waves, there is more and more uh, interaction, coordination of action um, with the women's movements. So more and more women's movement organizations, right, and feminists organizations are trying to work together for a common goal. Um, and that's uh, a new development, right? Um, again, one important thing is that all of these organizations, and that's fairly uh, unique, right, are very committed to radical social change. So in their agendas, it's not just uh, change for women's situation, but they see their struggle as women as part of a larger struggle for social justice in the countries. Right, so, um, so it's not about the individual struggle of a woman, right? But it's how that the struggle of, a, of women in every country, in every moment, intersect, connect with the needs for radical social change at a larger scale, right? And that's very unique if we compare that with um, many of the agendas, for instance, of women organizations in the United States, right? 
which is what we know the most. Um, and of course, today there is a very strong focus on uh, fighting violence against women, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and of course, there are many examples of groups in Latin America. Uh, one interesting thing that I want to call your attention if you're interested in pursuing and learning more about these is that um, since uh, 1981, Latin American women, ha uh, feminist women, uh, organizations have been organizing these regional conferences called Encuentros. Um, and you have a layer, a list of all the Encuentros. The last one was uh, in Lima, Peru, and for reasons uh, related to money, instability, etc., they have not done another one, uh, but they were fairly consistent by annual gatherings. Um, and uh, these encuentros publish memorias, right? Um, so books that gather all the all the, the papers that are presented that were presented at those encuentros. Um, so this is a. Um, a wonderful slide, right? Because it's kind of, uh, we could end here, but I am not, right? So there has been this long history of women activism, right? I just show you some of these women. Uh, there has been a long history now from the 60s on of feminist women's movement, right? Fighting for changes. And these women that you see here are women who have recently occupied the presidency in their countries something we are yet to see in many countries of, quote unquote, the North, right? This is an amazing woman. She just uh, finished her term, uh, Michelle Bachelet. She was actually tortured. Her family was tortured during the dictatorship of uh, uh, Pinochet in Chile. And uh, she became the, the first female president of Chile uh, and actually won two different presidential terms, uh, not consecutive because that's not allowed by the Constitution. Um, so, so we could say, okay, we won, right? Women have achieved the highest, um, it's like you know, when Obama was elected, many people thought, oh, we're done with discrimination, right? Because now we have a black president, right? Um, but of course, that's not the story. This is an important thing to recognize. Right? And these women have achieved, some of them uh, you have made it to the presidency um, you know, out of their own, uh, most of them, you know, out of their own uh, struggles, their own um, uh, participation, social participation. A few of them have made it to the presidency because they, they belong to important political families. Right? So it's not all. Uh, but most of them, of course, um, became presidents because they deserve to be presidents. Um, there has been also a huge amount of literature produced uh, by women for women issues. And of course, if you're interested, I have a long list. These are just a few of the names. Um, uh, so you have literature and art that um, women have taken as instruments in their struggle for, um, for uh, their demands, right? In all areas of um, literature and art. Um, I, I will invite you, I'm sure we will make this available. Um, uh, I will invite you to watch uh, these videos. Uh, there's this, uh, uh, um, exhibit that was created um, of uh, artists of Latino heritage uh, uh, that, that are working in Latin America and US born uh, as well um, that uh, show different works produced by women, paintings, etc. And it's really fascinating work. Okay, so now I want to focus uh, for five minutes in a case. Uh, and then we can have questions. And this is the case of uh, what's happened at the border. For me, this is important because right now, we, of course, are all aware of the quote-unquote 
crisis at the border. We have women, families coming, um, trying to escape uh, violence, trying to escape persecution, um, terrible conditions, life conditions. And of course we have, um, I don't have to tell you what we have, but uh, <laughs> um, right, we have this movement against uh, these immigrants and they're all, what? called criminals, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to talk about the border. So one, in the southern border of the United States, uh, on the Mexican side, mostly US companies, but also companies from all, all, all over the world, but mostly US companies have created these uh, workers' centers, right? These centers, industrial complexes called maquiladoras. And the maquilas are basically assembly plants, right? So most of the jeans you have on, right, um, have probably have been produced in one of these maquiladoras, right? So where, anyway, so they're basically assembly plants and they look like that, right? And um, maquiladoras mostly, and, and for instance, most of the computers that are produced in the United States or by, or by UN, United States companies are assembled in these maquiladoras and many other products. It's fascinating to read um, the hiring practices they're written, right, as policies of these maquiladoras because they actually prefer to hire women. And they prefer to hire women because, remember that stereotype about the perfect worker that is not demanding, uh, you know, there's a lot of description. They have very thin hands, right, so they're better for refined work of assembly, like assembling a computer, uh, but also they're not going to protest, protest. they're not going to complain. Uh, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be, they're going to put up with whatever, right? the company decides. Um, in the border, um, there has, and related to the maquiladora workers, um, there is a documented um, history now, particularly since 1990, of what we call femicidios, femicide. So femicide, this concept, right, um, is anti-female terror that includes a wide variety of verbal, physical abuse, such as rape, torture, sexual slavery, incestuous and extrafamilial sex abuse, physical and emotional battery, sexual harassment, genital mutilation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, of women because they're women, right? And that's hence the word femicide, right, femicide. Okay, so why do I talk about femicide now? Because at the border, um, there is, again, since the 1990s to this day, a history of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of female bodies being killed at the border. The case of Ciudad Juarez is notorious, but again, this goes throughout the whole border. And not only on the U.S. border, but this is the case. So there are maquilas. There's a connection with the maquilas because most of these women are maquiladora workers. And there are maquilas all over Central America, not just on the Mexico border with the United States, okay? Maquiladoras, we, maquiladora women, women who work in the maquilas, are target, targeted and are the target of rage um, because, in a way, they have altered the balance of power within the social structure. So the maquiladoras are the most important factories, right, providing work. They prefer women. So you have a huge unemployment of men, right? Women are working, are bringing the money to the family. They are now the, mostly the supporters of the family. And this alters the balance. The patriarchal balance doesn't work like that, right? So there is an anger against these maquiladoras, right? I mean, there are many, many reasons, but that's one of them. These women are becoming more independent financially, right? Um, they are going out to work, right? 
Um, many of the women who work in the maquiladoras on the border actually are from indigenous communities elsewhere in Mexico. And again, this is the same story. I'm just using the case of Mexico, but it's the same. You can repeat that story in Guatemala, in Honduras, in El Salvador, which are the countries that are mostly now uh, producing our desperate women and families who are coming to the border, right? Um, most of these women are indigenous women from indigenous communities that don't even speak Castilian. Uh, they're brown bodies, right? Um, and they're single women who are uh, working in the maquilas to provide for their family, to send money back to their communities. So in the case of Ciudad Juarez, which is in Chihuahua, uh, on the northern part, on the border with Mexico, uh, with the United States, since 1993, there, are, there has been over um, 1,500 young uh, women who have gone missing. Um, most of them are maquiladora workers. And uh, of them, um, and all of, most of them between the ages of 12 and 30, so very young women who are the ones working in the maquilas. Um, and they're mostly taken uh, by gangs um, while they're going in and out of the maquilas, right? In and out of the buses, buses that take them to the maquiladoras. Um, most, more than 800 bodies have been found, uh, mostly uh, thrown in the desert, mutilated, genitals caught. Um, I mean, the horrors, I mean, you, you read about this. There's an amazing book uh, that I have there on display about these, uh, these uh, with actually testimonies from families as well. Um, and of course, despite the longevity, I mean, we're talking about 1993 to this day, right, the longevity of these crimes, uh, really no one has been caught <laughs> doing these things, right, and if, of course there is a lot of documented involvement of the police, right, of the state, besides the organized crime, besides the gangs, uh, besides relatives who are up upset because these women are working, right, so there is a, com a very complex um, um, body of reasons, right, um, and of course, this is not uh, news in the United States, right? When we talk about these women who are coming with their children to the border, they're coming because they want to take our jobs, right? They want to be on welfare in the United States rather than what is happening in their communities? What forces people to leave their communities? Right? That that's what we need to think about and what responsibility we have. Again, um, these maquilas are on the border, right? The maquilas are owned by these companies. There are many things I cannot talk about, but for instance, um, uh, many of these maquiladoras, the way they function, they, they establish these huge uh, naves, these huge, um, uh, no, 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 like, uh, no, places of work, but they're, they're, you know, like what I showed you, right? Uh, they e exploit, you know, these women are working, working, working. Then one day, when it's not profitable, they just leave. And they leave everything like, there, like that. So they abandon the place. There is no accountability. Um, many of these maquilas um, actually dump because they don't have the same restrictions in terms of dumping uh, hazardous materials, right? Um, they dump a lot of stuff, they dirt everything, and they just leave. And everything is left there. Embedded here is a video that I don't have the time to show you, but um, about uh, these. Uh, there is a wonderful, wonderful collective, uh, women's collective, Maquila Women Collective, that have been producing these documentary films about precisely that issue, right? Um, the United Nations report on gender violence and femicide in Mexico um, recognizes that violence uh, against women in Mexico is widespread and pervasive. Uh, normalized by a culture of sex discrimination and perpetuated by enduring impunity. And that's the issue here, right? That uh, is, uh, these crimes go um. So there is a lot of uh, literature, art, and mobilization around the issues of uh, women 
um, the, the, the women on the border, the femicide uh, of women in the border. I wanted to uh, point out uh, that first uh, book there, which is the one I have on display, um, uh, Making a Killing, Femicide, Free Trade, and La Frontera. And the second one is that it's a wonderful novel, really hard to read, but a wonderful novel uh, written about uh, the murders, uh, the Juarez case, right? But it's uh, written as a as a novel, so it's easier to read, although. Um, and there's that documentary. Okay, we're done. <laughs> so, uh, we have some time for questions, and I will entertain any question you have. <laughs> Comments, questions, oh, yes. Great. Yeah. So, uh, hold on one second. Um, Just as far as the, uh, When, when you were talking about the, uh, the different concepts and one of them was the machismo culture, I'm wondering about that influence on what you just were showing at the very end. Was there, was there this tension between that, the idea of the machismo culture having an influence mm -hmm. on women working? And right, and that's why, again, even the United Nations today recognizes that that culture, that prevalent culture of, uh, um, of the macho culture, right, of, um, it leads to a culture of abuse, of... Um, of uh, not understanding women's rights, right? Of seeing women as a tool, as something to be disposed, uh, something to be used, right? Rather than something to be taken as, you know, equal partners. And of course, all of this is complicated. I, again, there's so much to talk about. All of this is complicated with homophobia, right? Because these things go together. Right, so the, the, the macho culture is ultimately a homophobic culture, right? Is let's, uh, let's um, glorify these macho values, right? Um, because of the fear, right, of um, mining those values um, in a homophobic way. So those, all of these things, right, go together, right? Sexism goes, um, and, and gender phobia in every possible way, right? Uh, but yeah, absolutely, behind this, the, the, the culture of, ma the macho culture is so prevalent in Latin America. It is prevalent in the United States too, I have to say, right? But of course, I'm talking about Latin America, so. Um, yeah. Okay, other comments, questions? Any comment from a student? No? Yes. I just had a question to ask you. Instead of saying feminist movement and all that, do you think it would better better to be just general neutral? Instead of generalizing it to females need equal power and whatever, maybe it should just be like a general neutral. Like it shouldn't be men or women should be equal. It should yeah. just be we're all the same human being and it shouldn't be about whether women should have the right or men should. Because most of the time here in America, women have the right to have kids in a divorce over men. So we do have somewhat of a more of a power in certain situations. So maybe it should just be more of a, a set of gender. It should just be like, we're all humans and it should mm -hmm. be just an, an So that's a, that's a very interesting question uh, and it deserves a long discussion, right? Um, I would caution against it though. Let me explain to you why. In a perfect world, right? We shouldn't be talking about uh, race or ethnicity or gender. We should talk about social justice for all, right? Um, the reality is that um, historically, humankinds have actually isolated groups and they say that, okay, women should act this way and there are these limitations and these laws, right, uh, to affect women's lives, the same with um, transgender, the same with African Americans, right? So to dilute um, those claims and those needs, 
right, into a neutral, general humanity, humankind concept could be very dangerous. I wish we were there, but we are not, right? So there are gender-specific needs, the same way that are ethnic-specific needs, that are intertwined with general social justice issues. Because of course, when we talk about women's poverty, when we talk about women's, for instance, the example of the maquiladoras, right? At the border, um, the situation of the maquilas in the border comes out of a general situation of poverty, discrimination, corruption at a general level, right? Um, injustices, uh, uh, brutality, police brutality, um, right, the history of dictatorships, right? And that, those are not gender-specific issues. But within that framework, right, that feeds any social group, any social issues, you have gender-specific, you know, race-specific um, issues that need to be dealt with. In fact, I didn't have time to talk about one interesting element in the development of, of uh, women's movement in Latin America. And that was the, um, the relation between women and leftist movements in Latin America. That's a very interesting topic, right? Uh, many women, uh, many women, participated in guerrilla movements against dictatorships, participated in revolutionary movements, in the independence wars, I mean, in all social movements for social justice in Latin America. And within those movements, right, that most of them, all of them were dominated by leaders like Simón Bolívar, Fidel Castro, right, uh, Daniel Ortega, um, Chavez in Venezuela, right? In all of those uh, revolutionary movements, uh, most of these leaders said, yeah, we understand that women have issues and there are issues with equality, equality and women's rights, but right now we cannot take care of that. Let's put this aside because our main goal is eliminating poverty, right? Um, creating a democratic society, right? And eventually, we'll deal with women issues. That eventually never came up. So at some point, women got up and say, OK, when, when is that eventually happening, right? Um, let's put this right now. And that created a lot of friction within the leftists, um, um, liberal, and all sorts of movements, right? So many, many, uh, as I, somewhere in one slide it says, right, um, many women in Latin America who fought and were part of these social, general social justice issues said, okay, wait a second, your constitutions, the constitution you're, you're creating, where am I there? Where, where is the issue of, see, until you have equal pay for equal job, until you have the possibility of being the owner and the decider about what happens to your body, until um, men don't feel, or people don't feel uh, the right, that they have the right to abuse women just because they are women, right? When those things and many more are eliminated, then we can talk about, let's talk about humanity and, you know, how, um, but there are general social justice issues and there are group specific issues that need to be placed on the agenda, otherwise they, they disappear, right? And, it, and again, that has been the argument of even, you know, again, many leftist uh, movements who have said, oh, no, 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 let, we'll, we'll, women will, same with, um, I mean, Cuba is a great example, right? The greatest revolution in Latin America, right? Uh, women still are trying to fight for putting an ad on TV against cut calling and rape and, you know, because it doesn't happen, right? Or same with, uh, again, the rights and the discrimination against uh, Afro-Cubans, uh, Afro-Latin Americans, right? So those things have to be in the agenda and they have to be called by what they are, right? So 
It's, but it's a very interesting issue. Vic, you had a question? Uh, sure. Uh, so I, mine is more of a comment as you were describing all of the different history. One thing that I, I think is really important to uh, highlight as you did is that no matter uh, what the uh, conditions were that women faced, no matter what the gender specific forms of violence, that it's always women who are at the front lines of organizing a response to that. Mm -hmm. And it's not just response by putting their bodies on the line or fighting or taking to the streets, but developing the social analysis. You said, you know, uh, starting uh, from uh, Sor Sorwan. Sor that developing theoretical frameworks, developing analysis of social structures, of mm. power, politics, and so when we uh, when we look at uh, something like uh, feminism, there's, uh, there's the academic feminism that develops theoretical frameworks of, of gender and power. And, and that's when it becomes so glaring, uh, the omissions of who are the women from the non-first uh, world who contributed not just their life experiences, but their analysis, mm -hmm. their, their frameworks, their visions. Mm -hmm. And so whatever we have uh, today or whatever society we have, uh, no matter what the brutalities may be, one can only uh, have nightmares about what the world would be without the resistance mm -hmm. of all of the, the women, the movements, the organized mm -hmm. forms of response that, that you described mm -hmm. so beautifully and compactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and again, you know, back to um, uh, the question, right? Um, the brutality of crimes against women today, right, uh, as I just briefly <laughs> demonstrated, um, is so huge. And, and again, it's the brutality because, because of their condition as women. And you can also, you know, think about that brutality against, you know, transgender people, against non-conformist gender people, right? So, um, but these are very specific issues. That doesn't mean there isn't a lot of murders, et cetera, against men and, and other groups in society, right? Uh, but the specificity of these is the fact that these are crimes against people because of their gender, right? And that has to be highlighted. And yes, indeed, um, it is women who are leading uh, both intellectually and in terms of political action, uh, the fight against those issues. Hi, Maricela. Yeah, it's on, it's on. It's on, you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, you made the uh, comment, and you're echoing it actually right now again, uh, that I completely agree with uh, about the, the oppression of women and the connection with um, you know, homophobia, those things go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, now we are seeing uh, developments, uh, you know, legalization of same-sex marriage in Argentina and Brazil and mm -hmm. Colombia, Uruguay, I think, Mexico mm -hmm. City, uh, many states in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, the, so there's progress. Argentina leading the way on transgender mm -hmm. rights, right? Uh, right. Yeah, so. Yet. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you see these going hand in hand with an improvement in women's rights and mm -hmm. women's power? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, all of those, again, because of the connection between, uh, between all of these gender-specific uh, issues, right? Uh, improvements in one area lead necessarily to improvement in another area. And in fact, it is many women together with transgender and with um, homosexuals in Argentina particularly. I just, you know, was, again, as I said, I was there in studying the situation, right? Um, it, it is that coalition that has resulted in something like the recognition of same-sex mar same marriages in Argentina. Um, yet again, that, so one is hopeful, right, that this, this uh, definitely leads to 
improvements in all the areas of the gender str struggles. But yet, uh, there are many things that still, like for instance, the, the fight for abortion, the legalization of abortion in Argentina, um, which is absolutely forbidden no matter what. Um, so uh, that's still, so they, they have been able to legalize same-sex marriage, but not you know, the, the right to decide, right? Um, even in cases of rape and uh, decide what to do with your body, right? So, but. Yes. So I have an actual question. <laughs> Um, so recently, uh, there have been develops in, developments in Venezuela with uh, especially political developments. There was a uh, blow to the state, so a military takeover. The army mm -hmm. turned against uh, Maduro. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what, you, what your perspective is on um, women's role, because I know a lot, a lot of times in these military moments, women's voices are... Um, are snuffed out, um, but in Latin America, not as much. I think there have been a lot of like military, like really tough military leaders that are women underneath inside of these movements. So I'm wondering what you think, um, I, I just wanna know what your perspective is about the blow to the state that happened last uh, yesterday mm -hmm. uh, in Venezuela mm -hmm. so um, it and its implications in Latin America. One has to see, uh, it has to be seen, right, if indeed Guaido and, and all this uh, coup d'etat that is uh, developing right now as we speak in Venezuela, if it succeed, we'll see what happens with women's rights and, uh, and women's issues in Venezuela. I'm very suspicious about this coup d'etat, um, but that's a different story. Uh, but in general, the military in Latin America, I will argue, um, has not had um, strong women leaders. Uh, that doesn't mean there are no women in the military, but in general, uh, the official military, I'm not talking about the guerrilla no, movement. I'm talking about the, the official the military powers. Uh, uh, powers in Latin America do not have strong women uh, because it's a very, very, very patriarchal structure. Um, it's really interesting. I see within that patriarchal structure, though, that... Um, that a lot of times women's voices are stronger than they are, like in the North, for example. Well, it, it seems like women's voices are kind of just softer up in the North and in the South. Women like are the, very vocal in the Latin America. Madres de la Plaza de Mayo. Yeah, and but they're not part of the military. Right, right. They're not part of the military. And that doesn't mean, I mean, they definitely sh shook the military structure of the dictatorship. Um, definitely. Uh, and they contributed, not only them, but they were, you know, part of those the, uh, who, who contributed to the demise, right, of that military dictatorship. But there were not voices within the military. So that, those are two different things, right? Right. I just yeah. feel sometimes from the perspective of being from north, the north, uh -huh. um, that the Latin American women a lot of times have a better counterattack. They have a mm -hmm. faster, quicker counterattack, and then I think that's why they've come up into the presidency because mm -hmm. it's it happens really fast, and uh, and you know they work together. Yeah, but, but again, yeah. Uh, um, I, I agree. Know. I mean, they they're very activist. I mean, there, there's a lot of activism, yeah. um, and it's very visible, right? They make themselves very visible. For instance, uh, w one less known but extremely important women's movement in. Latin America was what happened. So the first big dictatorship of the 1970s was the dictatorship of Pinochet in Chile. And it was the movement of the arpilleras. These were women who started making quilts in the basement of churches. Uh, because until they started doing that and selling them outside of Chile, the world didn't know what was going on. So it was thanks to those women who the, you know, that the word of what was going, you know, was coming, what was happening inside Chile was portrayed in these amazing quilts, right? That then they sold and they were taken out into Europe and then suddenly it was like, wow, what's going on here, right? So, um, so again, a huge history of women's activism. Um, but I will argue there has been a very strong activism of women in the United States as well. I mean, we were able in 1920 to achieve the right to vote. Um, Cuba achieved the right to vote, women meaning, in 1934, 
right? And much later, all e everywhere else in in, Latin, in South America. So, um, so uh, there is a very strong women's movement in the United States. Um, only that, of course, we who work on Latin America know a lot about, <laughs> I mean, what's going on in, in Latin America. But yeah, there, there's a very strong activism. But my clarification to your original question is that that activism doesn't come from within the military. No. Right, okay. Any more questions, comments? Well, thank you for coming.